at the Northern Illinois Food Bank today, serving for Chapel Street Church, and we're having a great time. We are packing orders for the food pantry. We got tons of stuff. I don't know. It is so much fun. So I've been serving at Buddy Break for a decent amount of time and it's always just like the best part of my weekend. Every Saturday when it happens, you know, 10 to 1, you see all those smiling faces, all the kids running around and it, it just means so much to me, let alone the kids and the families. And it's a great way to serve, but also like I love this environment so it's really important for me to be here with the kids. I think serving helps to, to not only help out others, but also it's a way to, to fulfill some of the needs that we all have. Just giving back and uh, bringing a smile and bringing some love to people that, that might need it at certain times of life. We're serving the community as a church because we as believers are called to love the people around us and one of the ways that we can do that is to serve the people around us and like do things that we're doing here today where it's like hey we're staying with picnic tables or like hey we're cleaning up your art room stuff like that. So we're here at uh, Schneider Elementary School, one of our closest neighbors actually is right across from our North Aurora campus. Uh, and we're spending some time just painting some classrooms, doing some tidy of work for them, just to bless the staff as they head into the new school year. It's good to look back over this last month and see how so many of you have gotten involved serving in your communities. Uh, that's really what we're about here at Chapel Street Church. We want to be a gift and a blessing to our neighbors. That every one of us uh, should be living a life of service, not just in a month where we focus on it, but every moment of our lives, we should be looking for ways to bless the people around us because that's what's happened in our lives. We've been blessed by the love of God. We say often around Chapel Street here that we want to be a place where you can experience grace, grow in your faith, and through service, make an impact for God's kingdom right where you are. And perhaps this month has encouraged you and you're looking for new ways that you can serve. We'd love to help you find ways inside the church and in the community to continue to live a life of service that's a blessing to the people around you. Let's pray now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that uh, you are the great servant. You said that you came out into this world to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. And we thank and praise you for that. Our lives are made possible because of you giving up your life. We have hope for our future, forgiveness for our past, and, and meaning in our present because of your grace, Lord Jesus. Now we ask you to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. We've been in a series uh, on Hebrews chapter 11 called By Faith, looking at these Old Testament heroes who lived their life by faith in God and what that has to do with our lives how we as followers of Jesus today can live our lives by faith and it's really remarkable to see what these Old Testament saints have to say to us in our current cultural context today. They're highly relevant even though we're separated by the centuries. I don't know about your family but we're dog people in the Fraser family. We, we have a, a pet, a dog, Ivy is her name. She's been with us for almost 14 years which means she's uh, 98 years old in human years. 
Um, and she's wonderful. She's been a wonderful family pet, but I gotta be honest, she's a little bit crazy in her old age. And sometimes she drives us a little bit nuts. But most of, the, most of the time we just love her and enjoy her. We've conditioned her though to get a little treat, a little reward when she goes outside of the bathroom and comes back in. I think it started back when we were trying to get her to go outside to go to the bathroom as a puppy, but now we can't stop. When she goes out and comes back inside, we always give her a little reward, a little treat. And she knows this. And so in her old age, sometimes she scratches at the door to go out for no other reason than to come right back in to get her treat. Uh, and her ability to focus on that reward, on that treat, is amazing. In fact, if you forget to give her a little reward, she will stare at you, panting with her hot breath, barking, whining, fixated on you until you give her the treat because she knows that's what she's supposed to get. Now, I don't want to stretch this analogy too far because, quite frankly, sometimes Ivy and her ability to focus on the reward can be very annoying. But there is a lesson for us in there. Ivy's focus on the reward teaches me something about how we're supposed to be focused on Christ. Her ability to fixate on that to the exclusion of almost everything else that's going on around her is really what we're meant to be, how we're meant to live. Focused with our heart, the, as Paul says, the eyes of our heart on the reward we have in Christ despite all that's going on around us. And the reward you seek in life has a lot to do with the kind of life you live. Think about it for a minute. If the reward you're seeking, the thing you're pursuing is financial wealth and, and, and achievement, well, that's going to impact the kind of life you live. If the reward you're seeking or going after with your life is, is climbing the corporate ladder, promotion, that's going to impact the kind of life you live, how much time you spend at home or at work. If the reward you're seeking is your status, perhaps your followers on social media, that's absolutely going to impact the kind of life you live in the real world. Go right on down the list and you could make the case that that which we're pursuing, the, our reward, even if we wouldn't call it that, is the thing that's shaping the kind of life that we live. And we as followers of Christ are meant to be pursuing Him as our reward. He's supposed to shape the kind of life that we live. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 36 says this, Do not throw away your confidence. It holds a great reward. You need to persevere so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. Don't throw away your confidence, your faith, because you will receive a reward. That's at the heart of the character we're going to look at today from Hebrews chapter 11. His name is Moses. I'm going to guess you know something about Moses. In fact, this week and next week is a little mini-series within our summer series, two parts on Moses because he gets a lot of coverage in Hebrews chapter 11. He's kind of a big deal in the Old Testament. And if you don't know his story from the Bible, you probably know him from movies like The Prince of Egypt or if you're a little bit older, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. And we know about the burning bush story. You know about the plagues and crossing the Red Sea. But interestingly, that's not what the writer of Hebrews commends him for living by faith. We're going to look in this part at his early life, characterized by faith, and I want you to notice what's not mentioned and what is mentioned in terms of Moses' life and his faith. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. There it is, that word, reward again. Okay, a little background first on Moses before we get going. When God's people arrived in Egypt, remember last week we looked at the life of Joseph. When, when the people of Israel, which was just a large family clan, arrived in Egypt in the time of Joseph, they were about 80 to 100 people. That was it, a large family clan, a tribe. When they left some 300 years later, when Moses led them out, they were nearly 2 million people. And you can read about this in Exodus chapter 2. In the time of Joseph, the people of God, the Israelites, the children of Israel, enjoyed the favor of the culture partly because of Joseph's position, but they, they were favored, they were looked well upon, and they had privilege and status. In the time of Moses, when they left 300 years later, the opposite was true. They were despised, oppressed, even enslaved. So a lot's changed since the days of Joseph in Pharaoh's court. Let's look at Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It gives a little picture here. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. 
And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. So we see that the, God is blessing the people of Israel. They're growing despite efforts to reduce their population. God is blessing them and, and they're, they're growing rapidly in number. So much so that they become a threat to Pharaoh's power and control over Egypt. He's nervous about these, this large group of foreigners living in the land. And he just takes some decisive action. And his action is brutal, quite frankly. He enslaves them first, and then he devises a plan to uh, reduce their population. Look, look at Exodus chapter thir- 1, verses 13 and 22. So they ruth- ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. There's more to the story there, but Pharaoh is saying, we're going to make them work for us, enslave them by force, by physical f- force and threat. And we're going to put a, a governor on their population growth to keep them uh, from outgrowing us and becoming a, nu- a threat numerically by killing all their sons that are born, with, casting them into the Nile. This is the context into which Moses is born. The people of, of God are no longer favored in the culture. They're looked down on. In fact, they're, they're, they're oppressed and they're opposed. And every parent, of course, thinks their child is beautiful. And we read in the story that Moses' parents think he is beautiful. Do you know Moses' mom and dad's name? Probably not. You know Moses' name. His father is Amram. His mother is Jochebed. And they see their baby boy and they think he's beautiful. Well, every mom and dad thinks their baby's beautiful. But the point is there was something unique and special about this child. God's hand was on him from the very beginning. They try to keep him hidden for three months. They know the edict of the king, of Pharaoh. They know that the children found to be born. So what you have to realize is they had to hide Jochebed's pregnancy. She couldn't be seen that she was pregnant. And then when the baby's born, they had to hide that, keep him quiet. And for three months they do this, but it becomes impossible to hide the child. And so they take drastic measures to protect the life of their son. They make a little basket of reeds, cover it in pitch to make it watertight. And Miriam, Moses' sister, watches while they release the baby in the Nile River. Not casting him into be drowned, but releasing him, hoping someone will find him. And the story of how God provides is just remarkable. This brings us to the first point, the courage of faith. The courage of faith. It's not insignificant that the story of Moses' faith begins with his parents' act of faith. The story of Moses' faith starts before Moses is born and when he's an infant. He's the product of his parents' faith to a degree. They refuse to obey the wicked edict of the king, but to obey God. And the providence of God, his grace, is amazing. Let's read Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. By faith, Moses, the child grew older. She brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. That's what his name means, to be drawn out. Here's the story. Moses is found by Pharaoh's daughter. Miriam is watching Moses' sister. Moses, uh, Pharaoh's daughter says to her servants, go find a Hebrew wi- a mother, wife, to nurse this child. Guess who they find? Moses' own mother. This is incredible if you think about it. The sovereign grace of God can be found in some very, very unlikely places. He's watched over by his sister. He's found by Pharaoh's daughter. He's nursed by his own mother. He's raised in the court of Pharaoh. God's hand is over this child, Moses. Now, before we move on to look at Moses' actual faith, I want to just pause and offer a couple observations that you might miss. First, To those of you who grew up in a home where your mom and dad loved God, they weren't perfect. No parents are. But they taught you about the love of God. They modeled for you a life of faith. You were given a great gift. Praise God for that. Sometimes I think it's tempting for us to believe that if we don't have some radical conversion story, some crazy story where our life was a mess and God saved us, that we don't have a testimony. That's not true. If you grew up in a home or are growing up in a home where your parents knew God, loved God, and taught you about God, praise God for that. What a legacy you've been given. Don't waste that. No parents are perfect, as I said, but praise the Lord for moms and dads who love God and teach their kids to do the same. Second, regardless of the kind of family you grew up in, perhaps that's not your story at all, be on the lookout 
for God's sovereign grace in ways that you might not expect. I mean, think about the story we're looking at. Moses, who would expect that releasing him in the Nile, he'd be found by the daughter of the most powerful man in the world, nursed by his own mother, protected, nurtured, given the best education and upbringing that the world had to offer. Sometimes God's provision comes to us in unlikely ways. Some of you might be spiritual parents for those who didn't grow up with a good mom or, a mom or dad. Some of you might be older brothers and sisters to those who have not had somebody guide them and teach them. Some of you might be longing and looking for that yourself. You might be encouraging friends that are unsought. Unlikely allies, you might have this opportunity. So I want to encourage you, praise God for your family if they taught you about the love of Christ and look for God's unlikely grace in all kinds of ways. All right, let's move on. So Moses grows up in the palace, and we don't know much about his life for the next 40 years. In fact, for, for, from the time he's found by Pharaoh's daughter until he's 40 years old, he's just in the palace. We only get a couple of verses. Acts chapter 7, in Stephen's speech in verse 22, he says that Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he grew mighty in his words and his deeds. That's it. So he basically gets the best education that the world has to offer. Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world at the time. He's growing up in the palace, the, the Pharaoh's palace. So he has the best of everything. And he's a man mighty in word and deed. And this, again, there's something unique about this. God's hand is on this man, Moses. But somewhere along the way, Moses comes to the realization. He has a wake-up call. I was talking to a friend recently uh, while we were playing golf, and he said that during COVID, God gave him a wake-up call in his life spiritually. At some point in this 40 years, Moses has a wake-up call where he realizes that his true identity is not an Egyptian. He doesn't really belong in Pharaoh's court. He understands that I'm, I'm one of them, the slaves. That's my identity, which is a shocking thing for him, it must have been for him to come to real, realize. And we're not told much about that. But this brings us to the cost of faith. The cost of faith. Moses chose to be identified with the Israelite slaves rather than Egyptian royalty. This is a shocking thing. Let's look at verses 24 through 25. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, these are important words here. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, rather choosing to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. This is a, a fascinating thing. By faith, Moses refuses something and chooses something else. What's he refusing? He refuses to be identified or called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It's an issue of identity for him. This is not who I am. Now, that, that, that's a, you have to pause and think about what it is he's saying when he does that. He grew up in the palace. He had all the rights and privileges of, of royalty. He had all the power. He had un, literally unlimited a, 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 a opportunity in his life. Everything was at his fingertips. He has the status of, as a prince in the most powerful nation on earth. And he says, that's not who I am. That's all he'd known. From the time he was an infant, he's been raised in the palace. And he gave it up. Why? Why would he do that? A number of years ago, my wife and I took a trip to Zambia to visit one of the hospitals uh, for a ministry called Cure. Cure International puts uh, first world equipped and resourced hospitals in developing countries. And we met a, several surgeons there. One, we stayed in a little house, a little bungalow on the hospital grounds in Zambia. And we met a guy named Dr. Jimmy. He's from, the, from Great Britain, from the United Kingdom. He was one, one of the top uh, orthopedic, uh, pedi pediatric orthopedic surgeons in his field. Uh, he was, had kind of the world by the tail, so to speak. Made a lot of money, well known, um, and he gave it all up to be a rotating surgeon in Ethiopia, in Malawi, and in Zambia for the least of these, these children who could not give this help otherwise. I was touched by that. He, he went to medical school, he trained, he was the best in his field. To do what? To go labor in obscurity. Why would he do that? Well, Moses grows up in the palace and gives it all up. Not only does Moses give up his privileges and status and rights, he chooses to be mistreated. So he's not just saying no to the good things, he's saying yes to the oppression and mistreatment of his own people. He actually chose to be mistreated by identifying with a group of, of despised and oppressed people in the culture. This is amazing to think about. 
I think the key to understanding what's going on with Moses at the end of verse 25 is this word, the fleeting pleasures of sin. I think this word fleeting is key here. Moses came to the realization that this is not all that there is to life. This riding around in chariots, taking sailing trips on the Nile, drinking from golden goblets, you know, whatever. Like this life of royalty and luxury and pleasure, this is not all that there is to life. It's what the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 2 verse 1 says, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But this too proved to be meaningless. I tried to satisfy myself with wine and it proved to be meaningless. I built the finest houses and bridges but it proved to be meaningless. The writer of Ecclesiastes goes right on down the list of achievement and acquisition and pleasure, and none of it's satisfied. It's as if Moses comes to the place in his life where he realizes, there has to be more. I'm meant for more. This is not what I'm made for. This is not who I am. Now, you might not be living in the pa a palace life of royalty and luxury, but I know many of us have come to that place where we realize, you know, chasing the American dream of a, of a nice home, a vacation home, and a comfortable life. Is this really what it is? I'll never forget sitting down with a man who I got to know. I was coaching his son and my son on the same little football team, and he knew that I was a pastor, and he made an appointment to see me over a cup of coffee, and we, got, we knew each other through our kids' sports, but didn't really know each other. He said, I grew up in the church, but I kind of walked away from faith. I'm spiritual, but not very religious. And he goes, listen, I'm, I'm wrestling with something. I said, well, how can I help you? He said, I... I've got our lake house. I built my own business. I own my own business, what I always wanted to do. My, my kids are doing fine. My marriage is, you know, everything's fine, but I just feel empty. I feel like, is this it? Is this all that there is? There has to be more. And he's right. There does have to be more. Maybe you're at that place that Moses came to where you, you realize this is not my life. And the point is, there is a cost involved in the decision to follow Jesus. It is going to cost you something. It isn't free. We talk about grace being free. It's only free to the one who receives it. It's not free to the one who gives it, God, certainly. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in his uh, classic work called The Cost of Discipleship. He says, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that the dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ, as we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing happy life. But it meets us at the very beginning of our union with Christ. Because when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Kind of a cheery little invitation there. Come and die. But think about Moses' life. He realizes this life of luxury and comfort and ease is not what he's meant for. And he refuses it and chooses rather to be identified with people who are oppressed. But they're the people of God. They're his people. And it's his God. Those of you under the age of 25, I want to talk to you for just a minute. I know that you understand something about the cost. I know many of you are wrestling with this cost. If you're part of Gen Z, uh, under 25, whatever that demographic is, you know that if you're really going to surrender your life to Jesus, if you're truly going to turn yourself over to him, and you're going to let him have authority over your desires, your preferences, and even your will, then it's going to cost you something. At the very least, it's, it might cost you your reputation uh, in social circles. There will be times when the culture will feel like it's against you, scratching its head about you, maybe even resisting you or opposing you. And that's a high cost. It's real. And maybe you're wondering, is it worth it? Is this Jesus thing worth it? By the way, that's the question the Hebrews in, that, that the author he was writing to were also asking for different reasons. I sat with um, a group of our summer interns, four remarkable young women, just recently. And I asked them, what's the biggest challenge facing your generation in, in terms of following Christ? And they said exactly this, the pressure to conform socially to pressure to say and do what's acceptable with the culture. And I said, well, what's the most important thing the church, the community of faith, could provide for you? And they said, mentoring, discipleship, someone to walk alongside of us, to encourage us, to teach us, to hold us accountable. 
because it's, it's a difficult choice to make, and there is a cost involved. Now, what we receive is far greater, and we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to rush past this. For all of us, whatever age, if we're going to surrender our lives to God, there's a cost involved, and that's what we see here in the life of Moses. There's a real cost of faith. And this question, is it worth it, brings us back to what we, where we started, the idea of the reward. This brings us to the confidence of faith. The confidence of faith. Now, where does Moses get the courage and the confidence to make such a costly decision? Actually, the author of Hebrews tells us in verse 26. Hebrews 11, 26 puts it this way. He considered, this is an important word we'll talk about, the reproach of Christ as greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. This word considered, it's an interesting word. It means that uh, it's not the usual word sometimes used in Greek, logizomai, which means to think rightly about or to account for accurately. It means uh, to look forward, to prepare ahead of time. Uh, to, maybe you could put it this way. To factor in the future would be a way of translating what that word actually means. But what about this, this phrase, the reproach of Christ? Moses lived 1,500 years before Jesus was born. What, what is the writer of Hebrews talking about the reproach of Christ? Well, the writer is telling us that Moses, by faith, is able to look down the corridors of history into the future and see, not perfectly, but see what God would do in Christ. You know, Jesus has something similar to this in John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, saw with the eyes of faith what God would do in Christ. Not perfectly as we do, because we look backward to the cross. In fact, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died, these heroes, all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them from afar. That's what we're being told here about Moses. Now, he's looking to the reward. That's very similar language to Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. What you look to, you have a deep conviction, is true. It's not a false hope. What about this word reproach? What does he mean? Go back one slide for a minute. What's the reproach of Christ? Well, by reproach, he doesn't mean like Jesus is reprimanding him or rebuking him. He means the reproach of the culture that comes to anybody who would identify fully and completely with Jesus and the values of his kingdom. There will be a reproach. Brings us back to that comment about the cost of faith. Moses would rather suffer for being identified with God than to be accepted for being identified without God. Say that again. Moses makes the choice, and it's a costly one. I would rather suffer for being identified with my God than to have comfort, security, and acceptance in a culture without him. And quite frankly, even though that's is an ancient story, that's the same crossroads that all of us must come to. Am I willing to identify my life with Jesus, who suffered in my place? Am I willing to suffer the reproach of a culture that won't understand him. Jesus says in John 15 that you, if the world hates you, take heart, it hated me first. That doesn't mean we want to be hated or we're looking for conflict. It simply means if you're going to align your life with the values of Jesus, it is inevitable that there'll be people in the culture who won't get that, who will despise it even, who will even oppose it. It was true in the day of Moses, in the time of Jesus, and it's true for us today. Now, interestingly, Moses' very first attempt to identify and defend his people goes horribly wrong. He makes a mess of things. We read about the story in Exodus chapter 2. He, he tries to, uh, he goes out and sees one of his, his fellow Israelites being beaten by a slave master, an Egyptian, and he's full of anger at the injustice, and he kills the Egyptian. And he knows he's done wrong, so he buries him in the sand. And then he's found out about it. He thought he hid it, but it wasn't hidden. And he has to flee. He goes from favored son to hunted fugitive in a single rash act. And God will take the next 40 years of his life to shape Moses' character in the wilderness. Again, we don't see much about Moses until the burning bush story. 
He's in the palace for 40 years, and then he comes out, and he identifies with the people of God. Then, because of his rash act, he's on the backside of nowhere for 40 years, and his character is being refined. Here's the point I want to make. The, the character development done in the wilderness in secret is what produces confidence and courage in the public testing moment. And that's happening for Moses. So, friends, don't, don't reject or resist God's developing of your character in secret and in private. It's necessary if you're going to live by faith. We don't muster up faith when we need it. God's working on us and developing us, and sometimes in obscurity, in moments that nobody else sees, God would take that time to develop Moses, to get him ready for the burning bush moment. It's, it's not insignificant that the moment of the burning bush where God calls Moses comes at the end of that 40 years in the wilderness, not at the beginning. He's not ready yet. To get him ready to go back and to lead his people out of bondage. Let's look at verse 27 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Actually, he did this twice. He left Egypt the first time and fled into the wilderness in Midian, and live for 40 years, and God is working on him. He comes back to Egypt to be the deliverer, and he leaves again, not fearing the king's edict, to lead God's people out of slavery and bondage. But I want to come back full circle to this idea of reward as we finish. What was the reward that Moses sought, that he was looking to? Well, it wasn't the promised land, because if you know the story, he actually doesn't get to enter. What was it, the reward he's looking to? In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, we're told that the word of the Lord comes to Abraham in a vision, and he says, Abraham, do not be afraid. I am your shield and your very great reward. And then at the end of the Bible, in, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. Friends, the reward that we look to is not something God can give us. It's not uh, it's not, there's no guarantee that living a life by faith in this, li in this life that we live will, will mean riches on earth, will mean comfort and security and ease. The reward we look to is none other than Christ himself. He is our shield. He is our great reward. He is what we receive, and he is what we, who we look to. Only Jesus can make the riches and the status and the favor of this world look meaningless by comparison. Only he can do that. This is what we find in Moses, right? He's, he considered the wealth of Egypt as nothing as he's looking to the reward. I know for my life, there are many things that, that I look to that aren't Christ. There are many things you look to as well. If we're going to live a life of faith, we, we can learn from Moses that we, we are part of a legacy of faith, those who have come before us. There's a courage involved. There is a cost involved. But ultimately, there's a confidence that comes from knowing our true reward. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you alone are our reward. Forgive us for seeking any other reward in this life. Nothing else is worth it. Nothing else is worth pursuing or giving our lives to. We chase after these things and, and sometimes even find them, and, and we find they're futile. They're meaningless. And then we realize that it's been you all along that we seek. So, Lord, realign our hearts, realign our priorities, realign that which we treasure. Help us to see you and, and understand that you are our only true reward. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world not to be served, but to serve and to give your life for us, that we might live by faith in you and for you. We pray in your name. Amen. You know, that, that song is so perfect. The, the, one of the lyrics that strikes me is, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You're for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Moses lived a life when the culture seemed dead set against him. He knew that God was for him. And that's the call for us too. Friends, may you live your life knowing that God is for you and not against you because of Christ. Go in his name and in his glory. Amen.